This Hangout on Air is live. Well, today I wanted to welcome uh, Mr. Scott Vanderbilt, who is uh, a gentleman that I met here online on YouTube, who is a, what's the best way to put it, Scott? Is it, Are you a, um, a budding sound, location sound mixer? What, what do you call yourself? Um, yeah, a, 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 a relative nov novice, certainly, compared to others that I know. Okay. Okay. And Scott, Scott, I, the way I met Scott was, um, uh, and some of my videos, you'd left some comments and some very insightful, uh, things clarified a few things, uh, definitely learned a lot from you already. And so I, I was hoping we could just spend a few minutes here, Scott, talking about your background, because I think, um, your background is, I, I think an interesting one from the standpoint that you're really kind of just getting started as a sound mixer. So, so Get, oh, and, and actually, you're, and you're hailing from uh, Los Angeles, so you're right in the thick of things as well, as far as filmmaking is concerned. Indeed, yes. So, so tell us a little bit about kind of just professionally, um, you know, where you started and, and where you're headed right now. Uh, well, my goal is to to make documentary films, but uh, I decided to pick up uh, a craft because um, I wanted to work my way in, make some contacts. And, and I focused, as I told you before, focused on sound. Uh, first of all, because I love it, but also because it tends to be one of the departments that there are uh, fewer people. I mean, sound tends to attract uh, nerdier, socially dysfunctional people. So I'm <laughs> pretty, pretty squarely into that category. Uh, so, and I just, and I have loved sound my entire life and I'm a big music fan. Uh, so it seemed like a natural. And, uh, so yeah, so I've been at it about a year now, um, okay. and have uh, started to pick up work more and more steadily. Finding jobs is is not quite as easy as one would would like it to be. Yeah, but uh, as time goes on, you make you make more contacts, and uh, you get pe people call you back, uh, which is always flattering. You know, you didn't screw it up too badly if they call you back to do a second job or a third job, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll pass your your name on to others. Uh, so I've gotten. Uh, a few jobs that way as well from referrals from from um, presumably satisfied clients it's also networking with other sound mixers who are doing the same thing because uh, most sound mixers tend to be one man shops and as a result uh, that's not a very scalable way to do business because uh, in this town a lot of production tends to be seasonal so it's a, a lot of feast or famine. I mean, you could hit the phone could be ringing off the hook and there's just not enough hours in the day and days in the week for you to, res to be able to, to respond to all those clients. So a, a lot of mixers who are good and get work are frequently in a position of having to tell clients, well, no, I'm sorry, I can't work for you because I'm booked on, on another show right now. But, you know, I know such and such and this person, he or she would, um, would be good to work in my stead. And I've, I've had a, a, a couple gigs that way as well. So, so it's good to network with other mixers and make, make their acquaintance and demonstrate to them that you're competent at your job. And as a result, they'll, they'll happily pass you on because no one wants to recommend somebody with whom they don't have an existing relationship and uh, some idea of that person's competence because that will reflect badly on you. If you refer a job out to somebody else and they mess it up, that's certainly going to going to reflect badly on the person who did the referral so so they like absolutely to know, like, yeah like to do, i mean just like anything that's certainly not unique to to this this type of work right for sure so so you um if when you get a when you get a gig you know nowadays if, if if you get a gig it's a it's typically going to be what type of thing is it going to be a commercial is it going to be for producing a short film what, what kind of things are you doing well, um, what I'm doing predominantly are shorts, uh, short narrative work. Um, there's a fair amount in that town from people who are just, but in you know starting off their career as a producer or a director. There are three or uh, no more, probably a half dozen fairly good sized film schools in Los Angeles between USC and UCLA and Loyola Marymount, and then there's these smaller schools like New York Film Academy and some of the other four-year colleges and and even some of the, the community colleges have film programs here and they're always hankering about I mean, again most people they when they start a project for for a school, uh, school project they'll have a director and a writer and most of the uh, all the top of the line talent but when it comes to sound there's not many people who have a dedicated sound program so they frequently have to go to independent freelancers 
for sound. So, so I picked up some jobs that way as well. But yeah, it's been mostly narrative, uh, some documentary, some corporate PSA type of things. Um, I'm going to be doing my first ENG job uh, relatively shortly here at a local trade show. Um, so that will be a slightly different uh, type of job, which I'm actually looking forward to. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's all that comes to mind at the moment. Okay. Oh, and, I, and, a, and a couple features, of course. I mean, LA is a big feature production town, as you can imagine. A lot of work here and not just, you know, the big studio stuff, which is beyond, uh, you know, beyond my grasp at this point for a number of reasons, the principle of which is not being a member of the union, but a lot of non-union production in this town, people doing million dollar features, $2 million features that shoot for 17 or 19 or 21 days. A lot of horror films in this town. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I hear about people doing horror, which is probably the least interesting genre in the world to me uh, personally in terms of the things that, that, that I like to watch. But, uh, but yeah, that there seems to be a lot of that. So yeah. And I've done a couple, a couple features. Um, one I did entirely from beginning to end. And the other one I did pickups and filling in some days for the principal mixer who was, uh, who was not available. Okay. And, and what have you found so far? So you, you have a kit. Um, I, and I think we, we had talked earlier that you have some sound devices gear, um, what is it? What does a typical kit look like when you're doing a feature film? And then what does it look like when you're doing maybe a corporate gig or, and, or what are you planning on to take to this ENG gig? I'm, I'm curious how it changes in those different scenarios. Um, a fair amount uh, on a feature film, you're going to have probably quite a bit of wireless that, that you don't always have in a lot of other situations, but, um, you know, certainly you're, you know, a, a selection of, of boom microphones and hypercardioids for your, for your indoor scenes, wind, wind protection. If you have got exteriors, uh, a good boom pole and a standby and a, and it depends on whether you, you can either work from a bag or from a cart. Um, if you work from a bag, you know, you're, you're going to have a harness and a good bag and in which you're going to have a, a field mixer slash recorder. Uh, my principal one that I use when I'm working from a bag is the sound device is 664, which has got six analog inputs and it records 12 tracks. Um, excuse me, uh, 10 tracks, six, six ISOs, two AUGs and a left and right stereo mix. You can, anyway, there's accessories that you can expand that, but I don't, I don't have them. Uh, wireless gear. Um, I use Electrosonics uh, exclusively for radio mics. I have some old Sennheisers that I G3s that I initially bought when I was first starting out, and now I use those to run wireless hops to the camera or cameras. Um, and then a, a range of, of uh, lavalier mics. Um, so I use principally Sankin Cos 11Ds. I have a couple of Tram TR50s and a Countryman B6 that I use sometimes for talent, sometimes as plant mics. Uh, and there's hard to reach places where you couldn't otherwise get a mic. It's nice to, have, to be able to use a plant mic and sometimes wireless, sometimes wired microphones for that. Uh, and I say, okay, I mentioned the shotgun mics. For, so um, I have, well, I don't know if you wanted an inventory of all of it, but you're going to need at least one good shotgun. You should always have a, a backup of, of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Golly, what else? Uh, well, a good set of cans. You got to have a good set of cans closed here. Um, I use uh, a pair of Sennheiser HD 25s um, and have a, a Sony 6506 on as a backup. Um, you know, and then, uh, gosh, I mean, what else do I take to a gig? An Apple box, because, you know, I'm fre frequently having to, I'm only five foot eight. So, um, and I'm frequently in situations where it's, you know, you need to get up high. So having an Apple box is really a really useful thing to have. Um, I think that would be it for narrative work. Okay. Um, for documentary, um, sometimes just, you just need to, I mean, if it's like a sit down interview, single, single, uh, a single lavalier and, and wireless pack is fine. Uh, but you principally use a boom in those situations. I, I have a bias towards boom, and I think a lot of mixers do as well. Um, first of it, that, that was born out of a fear of wireless and being dependent upon wireless and, and, and some difficulty, difficulties I had in early jobs where um, some things I didn't realize about running multiple wireless units, about having RF hits and, 
and uh, proximity, even physical proximity of having transmitters and receivers in, in physical proximity was causing real problems. And it was a real nightmare that I couldn't quite uh, diagnose on set and resulted in, in, a, in some problems. But, um, but also just the sound, the sound is just, it's just not as good. And I think as you have uh, banged on a fair amount in, in your shows, um, it just it just doesn't sound as good. The the vocal quality is not nearly as nice. And a good boom mic, well placed, just beats everything. All beats set, uh, lobs all day long. It's just there's nothing sounds as good as a, as a good boom. So I feel a lot more comfortable with booming, and you basically treat lobs as as backups to only have to be used when when absolutely necessary. And how how how? So I, I definitely feel that way, and I and it sounds like very much you do as well. Of the other sound mixers you've met, how predominant is that way of thinking? Are there some that just are are just kind of going crazy with wireless and they and they prefer lavaliers and? Well, some shows you just have to have them. I mean, if you're doing reality yeah. TV, you, you've got to have lobs. Um, you should always have backups. You should always at least have two 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 mics on on any principles in any kind of show. So, uh, but no, I I would venture to say that the consensus amongst the mixers who I either know personally or whom I have, you know, read about or read their posts online or that, that, that by and large, they all feel the same way. Well, not all, but the vast majority of them believe that, that a good boom is better than anything else. Okay. And when you say, when you say boom, um, do you mean a shotgun? Do you mean a cardioid? Do you mean both? I'm using it loosely. I, okay. Uh, yes. A, a mic situated on a boom and the, the type of mic and pickup pattern will vary by the circumstances that you're in. Um, yeah. in, as you, as you, I'm sure you well know, you know, exteriors are a situation where you need to have some decent noise rejection. You want to get a good shotgun. Um, so I use principally, I use, I've a, of a few, I've sort of graduated as I've gone on and, and spent more money. I started out with a Rode NTG2, which I have now. And I use basically when it's going to get, uh, get destroyed, any risk of my mic getting destroyed. I'm happy to sacrifice that one. Yeah. Your battle mic. <laughs> Uh, then I got a Sennheiser 416, which is sort of considered to be the workhorse and has been. It's been around a long time. Uh, people always keep, you know, most mixers always have a 416 around for situations where it's it's uh, it's just it's a great mic. It's great at RF rejection. It's great in all kinds of weather. There's some types of mics that's there that some people believe to have some susceptibility to humidity. Uh, but a 416 is just is just the true industry workhorse. So uh, it's and it sounds great. Um, and then I um, have started to pick up some other ones. I got a Sankin CS1, which is a shorter shotgun. Excuse me, a CS1E, because I'd heard a lot of good things about Sankin, and I like their lavaliers a lot. Uh, and then another Sennheiser, an MKH60. And uh, then I eventually ended up getting a she uh, Sheps CMET 5U, which is considered to be one of the best best mics in the world for that sort of work. I mean, some people argue about that, but I think by and large, Sheps has a reputation that sort of speaks for itself. Um, so as you can tell, I have a problem with, with, uh, with <laughs> so that's what I would use in exteriors uh, or in a very large interior environment. I mean, basically what you want to avoid is any time situation when you're in, you're cl in a closed in space where you have any def danger of any reflections if it's a reverberant space you definitely do not want to be using uh you shouldn't go to a shotgun first in my opinion um but exteriors and places where it's it's a it's a room where you don't have to worry about that not a lot of hard surfaces um a shotgun and, and you also the other factor to think take into consideration is you have uh, extraneous noise coming from somewhere that you need to to sort of try to reject so shot directional mics like shotguns like that are great for that and you know, depending upon how on axis you are, you can, you can, you can really reject a lot of noise. Uh, I did a rooftop shoot a short while ago, uh, downtown Los Angeles and, uh, surrounded by construction sites and, uh, other buildings with huge air conditioning units. And we happened to be and the director, God bless him, decided to put situate the, the action, I'm not kidding you, no more than eight feet from two very large air condition, rooftop air conditioning <laughs> for reasons that aren't really relevant, just because that's sometimes that's what directors want you to do. Uh, and having a shotgun in those circumstances, real, a good quality shotgun really helped a lot. And the difference between, you know, if you boom and you just go on out 
you know, pointed at the mic. I mean, it, it, we're talking about probably in in that case, I would think I was seeing about 20 dB of rejection based on which way the, the shotgun was oriented. Wow. wow. So yeah. it made a big, big difference. Um, and then for interiors, um, you would typically, it's typically that you would use the hypercardioid pattern in that case. Or if you had a, another situation would be if you were doing a two shot uh, where you've got a couple people or a group of people in relatively close proximity, that, that wider pickup pattern uh, of a hypercardioid is really helpful because you don't have to worry quite so much about making sure that you're precisely on axis uh, like you would with a shotgun. But uh, interior spaces, typically you would use you would use hypercardioid because they're less susceptible to the reflections that you have uh, in a in a place in a, an environment with a with a low ceiling um, or with you know hard surfaces like bare walls or tile floors or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, they're shorter, physically shorter. Right, you know, right. A little easier to to get them where you need them to be. Yeah. Yep. Um, just a quick question. So, when, on on most of the and, and this may vary from from job to job, but are you typically are you typically is your client usually looking for both a, a stereo mix and ISO tracks in most things that you're doing? Um, well, I, the way I look at it is my client is the is the is the mixer. I mean, I, I consider that's the person who I'm ultimately trying to satisfy. Um, I have not yet had the privilege to work with directors who are really sound savvy. I mean, a couple of them have been, but by and large, they're focused on a lot of other things and sound tends to be very low on their list of priorities. They huddle around the video village and they like to watch playbacks of that endlessly, but I have, I've been on several jobs where I've never had a director ask me for a playback, um, which is kind of embarrassing. I mean, I, I would think that someone who was really uh, on top of things would would be just as curious to know what's what's being recorded on set to the to the recorder as they are to see what's on the camera but mm -hmm. it's just the nature of the business is that they all focus on picture um i am in 99 percent of the cases i'm one man banding so i'm really doing full time two full-time jobs you know swinging a boom and doing the mixing and and that's really not an ideal circumstance because uh, one of those is going to suffer. Um, and unfortunately, the one that usually suffers is, is the mixing because you're so focused on when you're on set, you know, staying out of out of camera's way, especially on multi-camera shoots, which are an absolute nightmare uh, because oftentimes they're setting up lights for reverses or for tights, you know, wides and tight shots. So, you know, I'm always being lit out of a scene and, the, especially with two cameras, finding a place where I can situate myself is really, really difficult. So in those kinds of circumstances, I'm so worried about being uh, in a place where I'm not going to be in, in my boom's not going to be in frame. I'm not going to be in frame. I'm not going to be casting shadows or reflections, things of that nature. A lot of times I feel like it's it's a battle when when they when G and E wants to come and light a scene. I kind of have to set myself up. I put my apple box and my bag down and sort of stake a claim. <laughs> Basically, if nothing else, just a signal to G and E that you guys got to remember that you got to make space for sound. So if if I didn't do that, I mean they would do all their setup and uh and oh, like at the last minute, you know, they're at AD calls, you know, scenes up and they're ready to shoot and yet I have not yet had an opportunity to to find a place where I can set my boom up. And then of course they spend an hour, you know, lighting a scene, they're ready to go. And I'm I just need two minutes to set up and they're all, you know, tapping their fingers and look at the watch and going sound, waiting on sound, waiting on sound. It's really right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, to answer your question, um <laughs> What what the ultimate on and product should be is is that yes in ideal circumstances if if it was a two man two person audio department and I didn't have to worry about booming I could work with more worry more about mixing and doing a live mix, um, which means you try to do a st well stereo is really sort of a misnomer you really want to sort of deliver a two channel mix and some people just even want a mono mix because what's the mix ultimately. Uh, and you have to get a sense of this on a job by job basis what's it going to be used for is it really is it going to be just uh, when they transcode the footage, is this just going to be on the dailies? So when, when it goes into post and it goes to the picture editor, do they just need basically to hear a, you know, a good enough audio to be able to do, the, to do their picture cut? And then they hand it off to the, to the dialogue editor, and that's when they're really concerned about what's, what's on, on the, uh, on, in the files. Um, so 
by and large, you 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 try to produce a mix, whether it be two channels or a mono, that that can help through the first stages of the post process. But then you record ISOs on everything. I mean, every mic has got to have an ISO track. It's that it's that's pre fader, meaning it's not. It's the what you do when you're recording with the faders is not going to affect these ISOs. You set your your levels and and those levels never change. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people in post will use, in my experience anyway, I know this is not the case always, we'll be using the ISO tracks when they actually get down to record, when they get down to mix the dialogue and do the cutting of the dialogue, they're going to want to go to the ISOs. Because especially if I was doing a two-channel mix, um, basically what you do is what's customarily done, not in all cases, is that you pan your boom all the way to the left and you pan all your lobs all the way to the right. So the all the lobs are together on their own channel and, and the boom is, is, is on its own. And then of course, so if I had four characters in a scene, left channel, and so I'm booming each four character, each of the four characters has an ISO. So that when I deliver that track, it's gonna have a left and right, left and right, again, more accurately channel one, which is gonna be the boom, which is gonna be mixed, I w if under uh, if circumstances call for it, I would be uh, working the fader on that if I could even get to it. Of course, when you're holding a boom, it's difficult to operate faders. Uh, and then all the lobs would be mixed together on that channel two or the quote unquote right channel. And then each of the uh, then there'd be five more isolated tracks. Uh, the first track would be the boom uh, pre fader, and then the remaining four tracks would be one for each of the for the lava layer mics. Again, also post fader. So if you're doing a two channel mix, that's seven tracks that you're delivering for those four characters. So two channel stereo and then five ISOs. Yep. And then the post person will be able to pick amongst them. And when they transcode the footage to make the dailies, they'll just use the, the two channel mix. That's all that will get married with the, with the, with the video footage so that they can cut picture. Right. Yeah. Don't know if that answers your question. Or I'm yeah, sorry. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I was just curious about that. Okay. Let Let's talk um, a little bit about gear. So you you'd mentioned that you have some sound devices, uh, recorders or mixers. Mm -hmm. What What? And this is a question I get quite a lot. As you know, people come and they're like, "Hey, you know, I'm a no budget filmmaker. I'm I'm trying to get better sound." Um, you know, and, and a lot of us are playing with these little two hundred dollar Tascam recorders with two XLR inputs. What What's if from your point of view, what's the big difference when you start moving into these sound devices, recorders, and mixers, or you know, other brands, Axcom, uh, and there, you know, there are plenty of others as well. Durability and reliability. I mean, you know, they're never going to fail. I mean, even if it's hot or cold or extremely humid, or you're getting banged around in a in a car or something like that. I mean, and it in equipment in production takes a lot of abuse, a lot of abuse. So you want something that's ultra reliable. Um, also, it's just higher quality components um, in the sound devices through the whole chain from the preamps particularly, um, but good quality limiters. I mean, I don't know much about Zaxcom gear, but the, I know a couple of people who use it and they, they love it. Um, it's, it's kind of a Coke versus Pepsi sort of thing, <laughs> personal taste. Uh, and plus, once you get into a particular environment of products, you tend to stay there because it's comfortable. So, uh, I, you know, I don't have anything against Zaxcom, but um, I just started with sound devices and I'm sticking with it because I've been really, really happy with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, just I never have to worry about that gear. I mean, it's just it's it's always going to function for me. And when you're on a set and you've got 20 people looking for you and you don't want to be dicking around with with gear that might be possibly... Uh, not working. That's the last thing you want to be do. So you don't you don't want to have it. You don't want to be the weak link in that chain. So it's just a lot of it is confidence. And I'll tell you also, and this is really a silly consideration, practically speaking, but the name value really actually counts for a lot. If you walk into a film set with a Rode mic and a Zoom recorder, um, you're not going to get taken seriously. You really aren't. Uh, and 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 really un under some circumstances. That kind of gear might be perfectly fine for what you're doing, mm -hmm. but it's just it's it's an image sort of status thing. People like to see the logos. Um, you know, people say, you know, oh, we're shooting on a red or we're shooting on an Alexa, and you sort of that carries with it um, some sort of badge of of you know this is a real production. And silly as that is, um, because a lot of the things that I've seen shot 
you know, on a red or an Alexa could have been <laughs> done just as well on a GH4 or 5D. Ultimately, you know, they're not delivering. Them. This is these are not features that are going to to distribution, and the, they're going to be seen on the web. Uh, maybe they'll make a DVD out of it. Um, but but by and large, a lot of I see a lot of people way overspending on the camera area and stuff that that could be better spent elsewhere, like a good mixer, and at least give the guy give the mixer a boom operator. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically it. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it's feeling, you know, feeling comfortable with it, and, the, and you can't, you can't beat the quality. Now, you know, in terms of the the extra price, I mean, is it a, are you getting a linear? Is there if you double the price of your gear, are you getting twice as good quality? Probably not. Uh, actually, I'm probably certainly not. There is a lot of diminishing returns there, but but you're getting you're getting the the confidence that comes with having pro quality gear, and you know it's never going to quit on you, mm -hmm. and um, and you feel a lot more comfortable. So, yeah, I think that's. Awesome. Okay. What what about time code? Do you end up using time code? Are you jam syncing? Oh, are you are you generating time code? How's that absolutely. work? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it depends, it depends on the project. Um, actually, there's I think there's only been one film I worked on recently that didn't use time code. It was a relatively low budget thing, and and uh, uh, so I didn't bring my time code gear along for that. I actually had rented it out um, that when I was working, but yes, no time code is really important in narrative, especially in multi-camera shoots, even in single camera shoots, it's still nice. Cause it, you can, you can sync that sound up so quickly with, with the right workflow. And it really, uh, makes things really easy. I mean, I've had, I've been on sets where, you know, at the end of the day after wrap, I mean, I've, I'll, 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 this is not my job. This is not sound's job, but in this particular case, I was working with a director I really liked a lot. So I was doing him a favor. I took the, the, the card from the camera, stuck it on my laptop and I synced the audio for him on the spot. So within 45 minutes after we'd wrapped, uh, I'd given him fully synced, uh, files, uh, deliverables, you know, the synced audio and video files that he could, he could start working editing that evening. Um, which is, which is really nice. So, uh, and it depends. I mean, there's, I have a couple different levels of it at the top of, end of the spectrum. I use, uh, I have an ambient time code slate, uh, which is a nice, beautiful piece of German made, uh, gear along with, uh, a ambient locket box for generating time code. Uh, my, all of my recorder, well, my, the two recorders I use each have internal, uh, time code generating clocks, the sound devices, 664 and the 788T both have internal time generators. So, so in the morning when I'm getting ready or whenever we're starting the shoot, you know, I'll, I'll fire up the mixer uh, and then I'll go ahead and then I'll jam the, the slate and then I'll jam the locket box or locket boxes, pass those off to camera. Um, and then uh, they go ahead and, and, and set them up. a lot. Actually, in a lot of times I have to help out camera and helping them to, to, to get the, the locket box connected and go through the menus. Cause it's really kind of embarrassing how a lot of those ACs don't know how to actually connect the time code gear to their camera, which really should not be a sound department consideration, but, but frequently is. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, that's how that works. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I just picked up a couple, not too long ago, a couple months ago, another set of time code generators that came from a, from a, a, a Kickstarter project, a German, again, another German con concern called tentacle sync. And these things are awesome. They're tiny, tiny, like, matchbox size time code generators. So they don't have any display in them or anything like that. But you, I picked up the pair of them for like, I was want to say it was like 500 euros. So, you know, 600 bucks, two time code generators and cables. Uh, and they're, and what's nice about these things is, is that you can use them, you know, with any kind of camera, they come with a, different cables that you can use, whether it's a red or Alexa or whatever. But where I've been using them mostly is on uh, shoots with uh, DSLRs where uh, you can plug them into the mic port and it sends, it writes a linear time code track to the, to the left channel. Uh, it also has a tiny little inboard microphone on it, which is probably no worse than the onboard microphone on any DSLR. So that'll pick up uh, sound for reference and that gets recorded to the second channel. So uh, it's a little bit annoying that, you know, when you play back that audio, you hear back the linear time code track, which is really annoying. It's, you know, kind of like a modem. So that you can, yeah. and it drowns out the, the right, the, the, the right channel. And they never seem to be able to be able to mute that channel by itself. Anyway, be that as it may, having the time code on those things is really, really nice. Cause you know, you get the benefit of, of being able to sync those up and tentacle comes with a very nice uh, application 
where it, it makes sinking a breeze. I mean, it's nearly instantaneous uh, to, to sync up those tracks. And then you export, you know, MOVs or whatever and, and pass those off with the, with the, with the audio already synced up. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, time code is, is, is very important and it really, people really appreciate it. Basically are expecting it now. Um, so is it, is it okay if you have, so if you're 664, your sound device is 664. Do you use that as a time code generator or do you jam sync yeah. that from something else? No, no, I, okay. I start, I start from the, from the mixer. Okay. Cause it's got an amb- internal ambient and it, and it, there's, I've never, well, now I can't say with absolute certainty because I've never had someone come back from post and say, Hey, you had, you know, there was drift, um, or you weren't keeping sync. Um, so presumably it's working fine, but, uh, but yeah, a lot's that makes as much sense as any, I'm certainly not going to use the, the camera's internal time code generator jam from that. Right. Uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, no, my mix, my mixer is the master in, in almost all, in actually every case that I can think of. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, just, just going back a little bit, if we could about, um, are we okay on time? Are you okay on time still? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Cause we could, we could, we could nerd out. Well, let, let's, let's say f- 15 more minutes and we'll call it good. <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious to go back and talk a little bit more about, uh, cardioid and hypercardioid mics. So indoor dialogue, cause that, that's what I end up doing a lot of, um, on mm-hmm. the corporate work that I do. So what kind of, what kind of mics do you look at there and, and, you know, kind of the, if you were to give advice to someone who's kind of getting started in that realm and they're going to do a lot of indoor interviews, what are the mics that they should be looking or, or maybe considering in that range? Depends on your budget. I mean, if money's no object, uh, get a Sheps CMC 641. I mean, that's considered sort of the gold standard there. It's, um, that's probably a $1,500 mic. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't get much better than that. I mean, maybe there's a DPA that might rival that in quality. Some people really like their their Sennheiser uh, MK50s, um, MKH50s, but uh, but the Sheps is what I see used more often than anything else. Uh, and well, I mean, I, yeah, that, that's that's what I see more often, and I've had very good results with mine. Uh, another reason that I like that particular mic is, I don't know if you know, but these, this comes from a family of mics that Sheps makes. They're called the CMC Colette. So they're modular. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the, what they call the preamp, which is not really the same as the preamp that you would find in a mixer, uh, is basically the, the, the large, the the 75% of the length of the mic. And then there's a capsule. Um, so these are interchangeable parts. You can put any of the Shep CMC capsules on this mic preamp. And so the, the capsule itself varies in size, usually around an inch. And then the, the preamp is about four, four inches or so. So if you decided you needed to have, um, an Omni, you could sweat swap out the capsule and attach that to the preamp and you're ready to go. They come, you know, there's probably at least a dozen different types of, of capsules that Sheps makes that will work with those CMC sixes uh, preamps. But the reason I, I like this quite a bit is there's an accessory that you can get called the GVC uh, swivel mount. And it's a, uh, it's a swivel mount that uh, basically just has, it's a, as you would say, it's a swivel. It goes between the preamp and the capsule. So, Sorry, I, I don't have one handy here. But basically what that allows you to do is, is so you unscrew the capsule from the from the preamp, you plug in the swivel, and then you connect the swivel to the to the to the main preamp itself. So what that does is is um, you can then swivel the capsule down at an angle from, you know, basically so I think you've got about 180 degrees of motion there on that. If you have that on a boom, if you're in a situation where you've got a very low ceiling or your camera wants to do a really wide shot, um, inches count a lot of times when you're trying to keep the boom out of frame. And even with the hypercardioid, which is really only not that long, it's only about five, five or six inches long by itself, once you put that into a shock mount and put it on the end of a boom, and you gotta give yourself a certain amount of clearance because you, if you're, especially if you're moving the boom, you gotta be very mindful of not striking the ceiling because then you'll get a mic hit and that will, will uh, screw up your take. Uh, so if you want to get as much headroom as you possibly can, having that mic be able to swivel down where basically, uh, you've only got about an inch and a half coming. Whereas before you had a good, depending upon what angle you have the mic at, 
it, it buys you three, four or five inches under the circumstances, which really can make all the difference between crashing the frame and not. Uh, so that's a very nice thing to have. Um, so I can get way, very close to the ceiling and still, and still stay out of camera's way, which they like. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I'm not familiar with any other mics that do that. There may be others. I, I'm just, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The, um, it, there are, um, the, the one I've been using is the audio technica AT 4053B again, hypercardioid. And that one's not bad. Um, I, you know, it, it, it's working okay in terms of most of the corporate pieces I'm using, but I don't think there's anything quite like that. Fortunately, I haven't run into that issue yet, right. <laughs> but sorry. I definitely see what you're saying, you know, answer your question. So that's, that's Sheps. That's absolutely the high end of the spectrum on the lower end of the spectrum. The first heart cardioid I bought was an Audix, um, SC, uh, SC one. I believe that's the right designation. SC one X or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. SC one X. Anyway, it's, and, and it also actually has interchangeable capsules as well. Um, I bought the one with the hypercardioid. That was the first hypercardioid that I used. Didn't use it that much. I used it probably only a couple gigs before I moved on to the Sheps, but still have it. Uh, and again, it's always nice to have backup microphones in situations where uh, you want to make certain, sometimes under some circumstances, you don't want to have your best mic out there because, uh, you know, there's a particular danger. Or I worked on a shoot uh, last week where I was, uh, where I was covered, uh, not intentionally, but, but got splashed with a, quite a bit of paint. They were doing a scene of an artist and, uh, I thought I had put position myself in, in the right place to avoid it. <laughs> no, I got pretty well streaked. Fortunately, it only got on my, my bag and my harness and my clothing and, and didn't hit my boom or my mic, but there's cases where you want to have sort of a disposable mic. So a lot of my backup gear that I, I bought before I would, would serve that purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely heard of people uh, mixers that go into locker rooms in particular for for sports news, and they say you definitely have to have a battle set of gear for that because otherwise <laughs> you're going to be losing your your thousand multi thousand dollar investment. I can absolutely see that. I've I've fortunately I've not had that that situation. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, let's see. Before we go here, so for for those that. Um, you know, more, people that are working on no but in no budget situations and they don't have the luxury of hiring a sound mixer. What kind of advice can you give people that are in that situation? Um, get the mic as close as you possibly can. That is the the single most important factor, more than anything else, is to have that mic as close as you can to the subject. And and I think you know you've done this. Um, you've amply demonstrated this in several of your episodes of where. Putting it on a boom just out of frame is absolutely the best place. I don't care what kind of mic it is. That having the mic within 18 inches of the sort of the of the source is going to be. You'll get a much better improvement over than anyone spending buying the best shotgun in the world. The best shotgun in the world sitting on a camera on the camera eight feet away is going to sound ten times worse than a crappy little hundred dollar boom that's 18 inches away. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's just, it's just mic placement. So get a good, uh, get a good mic stand and buy a decent boom so you can, can put enough cabling. And that's really the most important thing. And, and, and fortunately it's the cheapest. It's just, it's not the price of the gear. It's, 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 I think, as I said before, the inverse square rule, uh, rules all that's, that's, uh, every time you, you, you double the distance from that source, you're getting a quarter of the sound and you're getting a, what, a six dB drop. I mean, it's just, it's insane. So yeah, get it in there as close as you possibly can. And that's, that's free. I mean, basically, I mean, it's not, it doesn't cost that much to be able to do it. It doesn't always under all circumstances work, but certainly for people who are doing YouTube type broadcasts or any kind of sitting down talking head kind of stuff, there's no excuse to have crappy sound under the circumstances because you can always put a, and, and if you're just, and even if you're by yourself, put it on a boom stand, put it on a boom stand. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I agree. That was <laughs> that's that is the probably the biggest thing that anyone can do to to get the better sound. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time today. It's been it's been fascinating to to get a chance to talk to you and to to get your perspective. Um, and maybe again at some point in the future, we could have you back on and you could tell us some more war stories. Okay, great. Well, it's been my <laughs> pleasure. Thanks very much. All right, take care. We'll talk to you later. Right, you too.
Okay, very good.